This video is about clinical audit. We will talk about its definition, the difference between audit and research, what is clinical governance and the place of audit in governance, why do we do audits, who does the audit and what is the process of audit. If need be, when and how should we do a re-audit. It is important to remember that audit is a part of clinical governance. Audit is a quality improvement process that aims to improve patient care and outcomes. It is done by measuring current practice against explicit criteria and standards and thereafter bringing about changes in the service. These changes may be implemented within a team or a service level. It is not blaming or fault-finding process. What is clinical governance? Clinical governance is a structure or framework through which organizations are accountable for continuously improving the quality of their services and safeguarding high standards in the clinical environment. There are seven pillars of clinical governance and each pillar represents the area of activity which is used to make sure we deliver the highest quality of healthcare to patients. The first pillar involves patient and public and their involvement in some levels of hospital committees are considered important to ensure patient needs are kept high. The second pillar is of risk management, which means the process of identifying threats that would harm the organization, its patients, staff or anyone else within the facility. It also includes removing these threats in the organization or the department. The next pillar is for staffing and staff management. Whenever appointments are being made for any level of healthcare, they should have stated qualifications for entry, they should be employed on merit and subsequently be credentialed for the kind of services that they will perform. Fourthly is the pillar of education and training. In the last two years, we have seen the strong efforts for educating staff and patients about COVID-19. This is an example of continuing medical education, but on the job training and on the job education is essential to ensure a high quality of care provided by the caregivers. The next pillar is that of clinical effectiveness, which is a key component of patient safety. The integration of best evidence in service provision through clinical effectiveness processes promotes health care that is up to date, is effective and consistent. Clinical effectiveness includes guidelines, results of audit and practice guide guidance. The sixth pillar is that of clinical information which means having documentation of the clinical, operative or other records and the reports kept in the ordinary course of a physician's business. If required, these statements can be produced as a necessity for investigation or as a record in case the patient follows up. The seventh pillar is that of clinical audit, 
where we review our practice according to certain standards. The different kinds of studies done in clinical areas sometimes causes confusion. There are three, three terms which can be used interchangeably but which each has a specific meaning. So clinical audit is against agreed standards of best practice. An example is that if a time lapse of 15 minutes is required for transfer of an emergency patient from a labor room to the operating theater, then audits will be done to ensure these timelines are being carried out. Whereas research aims to create new knowledge. For example, you may want to find out if one drug is more superior to another drug in laboring patients for producing analgesia. The third terminology is service evaluation where we evaluate the effectiveness of a service. This is done to assess how well a service is achieving its intended aims. It is undertaken to benefit the people using a particular healthcare service and is designed and conducted with the sole purpose of defining or judging the current service. An example is how many patients are coming to the labor room on a monthly basis and how are we processing them towards labor room admission, towards emergency procedures or sending them home. Another example is are the patients coming to the labor room satisfied with the services being offered? We come to the question of why do we do audits? Audits are done for different reasons depending on the people involved. The main overarching reason is for betterment in patient care. However, the different people involved may have personal goals. For example, making presentations in conferences, publications in journals, increase the standing as an academic department of high repute and or increase the reputation of an organization as a provider of safe care. In addition, audits may be a requirement for the purpose of accreditation of an institution with a national or an international agency. Who does the audit? Audit is never done by a single person. It must be a team which is put together by an authority, for example, the chief administrator of a hospital or the head of the department. The goal is to improve patient care and therefore in a hospital setting, the team should consist of all the people who are involved in the care of the patient. These include nurses, doctors, administrators, technicians. Depending upon the topic of the audit, the concerned staff from other departments, for example, the operating room or the pharmacy may also be included in the team. How is audit planned? So audit is planned by brainstorming two important questions. What is the most common problem we are seeing in our patients? And what is the most significant problem? So these two should have a matching point at some place. Because for example, the most common problem we see in our patients may be anemia. Whereas the most significant problem may be doing cesarean sections in primary gravita. So we have to match the, the two topics or the two ideas or the two questions into one question which has importance in patient care and also which has guidelines for making a comparison. The main stages of the clinical audit process are Number one, selecting a topic. Once you have selected a topic and you have agreed on the standard or best practice that you would like to do the audit against, you then start developing a protocol. 
So, the protocol will include identification of the problem in your own setting, reviewing the literature to see the comparison, setting the research question, specific objectives and hypothesis, choosing the study design. Now, study design might be retrospective study design or a prospective study design. There may be some interviews or it, there may be some data collection from medical records. We then decide on the sample size depending upon the kind of, of information we have about the problem. Once you have made your proposal, you will require to get approvals and these approvals are from the department, from the institution and if there is an institutional review board or an ethics review board, they may have a requirement that you pass your proposal through this department. Once you have approvals and you start the audit, you collect the data and you then analyze the data against the standards, then you make your report and once you have discussed the report, you feed back the results and then agree on the changes that require to be implemented. Sometimes you may plan to do a re-audit to review the changes and to improve them further. For this, you need some time for the changes to embed before the re-audit. This may be six months or a year depending upon the agreement between administration and the departments. For this, again, you have to develop your proposal, get it approved, then collect the second set of data, analyze the re-audit data and feed back the re-audit results. With this, we come to the end of this video. Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe, share and like. If you do not like it, then let us know why and what improvements you would like to see. Thank you and goodbye.